many great Bible scholars and authorities on Romans talk about the Romans road, how it talks about the fact that we are in sin, the penalty of sin, and then we move into the consequences of sin and then the remedy for sin. And by the time we get to chapter five and six, we're looking at what is called sanctification, the call to holiness. And if you had a different experience, you would not view sanctification the way Wesleyan Arminians view sanctification, kind of in the idea of a second blessing that first you come to salvation and then as you grow along and you become more mature, you go on to holiness or sanctification. Those in the Baptist or Reformed or the Calvinist tradition criticize the Wesleyan approach to sanctification because they believe that once you're saved, you're sanctified. Taking the definition of sanctification as being set apart. They talk about the fact that from the very beginning, God set apart the Sabbath. And when the, the temple was established, or even the tabernacle, he set aside certain vessels for holy use and others for everyday use. So the setting aside is an immediate thing, has nothing to do with a process. Whereas in the Arminian Wesleyan tra tradition, in which the John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and the Methodist Church, the Salvation Army Church of the Nazarene, the other denominations that are in this um, consortium believe sanctification is a second blessing, a process you go to after you are saved. And I'm comfortable with that because I grew up with the idea as opposed to once you're saved, you're sanctified, set apart, but more, mainly that you are maturing. So Paul is really trying to talk in this passage to these people in Rome, mainly to Gentiles, that you need to mature. And that's where the passage is going. So what do you say in view of everything I've just said in 418 through 521, shall we remain in sin because there's grace? Okay, so let's get back to five. And you can see again, all the conjunctions. He's trying to make the point. So 520 is what leads into 6.1. Where sin increased and abounded, grace has surpassed it and increased more and superabounded. So he's talking about the fact that there's the law and the law is what makes us aware of sin. What I like about the expansion of the scripture is trying to get a definition for what sin is. And I like the word trespass. And when you think in a legal sense of trespass, you probably think of stepping on somebody's property or doing something to somebody else's property, trespass. Mm -hmm. And sin has the idea that since sin can only be done against God, we're trespassing, we are stepping, we're crossing over a line that God has drawn. What Paul has said is that before there was the law, before the law was given to Moses, I guess the law was given to Adam as well. You can eat up any tree of the fruit, but <laughs> the fruit of this tree, don't do it. And what Adam and Eve did was they trespass. They stepped over the line that God drew and did something he asked them not to do. When Moses was given the law, they were told, you know, the ten, thou shalt have no God but me, before no idols bow thy knee, take not the name of God in vain, nor dare the Sabbath day profane. Once the law is given, it shows where trespass is. You're stepping on something that God said, don't go there. But before the law is given, you went there because there was no trespass. Imagine someone decided to tell you that they owned Lake Michigan. And because it's called Lake Michigan, it belongs to Michigan. And the people in Toledo and other places which border Lake Michigan have no right of access to Lake Michigan because it belongs to Michigan. All along you thought, hey, we could sail and fish and do all the things on Lake Michigan. And now we find out it belongs to Michigan. And in order for Ohioans to use Lake Michigan, they need permission. So every Ohioan who thought they had the rights to Lake Michigan now realize they're trespassing when they go into Lake Michigan. I hope the analogy makes sense. Before the law, there was no idea of sin. But once the law was given, you know where you were not supposed to trespass. However, because we trespass, we now were guilty. And verse 21, I guess it's 20 says, where sin increased and abounded, because there was no sin until the law was given, grace has surpassed it and increased the more and superabounded. 
So let me go back to my Michigan Lake, Lake Michigan analogy. The Lake Michigan now belongs to the state of Michigan, but we also allow Ohioans to use Lake Michigan. If they are live on the lake, they can also use the lake. We've given them the rights to use Lake Michigan and the Canadians too, who might be thinking, hey, what about us? Are we chopped liver? They also get rights to use Lake Michigan, but nobody else. I guess I'm making the point here. Because now it is a sin to trespass, grace needs to be given. So grace is given to Ohioans and Canadians to use Lake Michigan, but not to New Yorkans or Floridians because they're too far away. And if they come up and they somehow have to cross another state to get to Lake Michigan, they're trespassing, but they have not been given that grace. It says that grace has surpassed the sin, the trespass, and grace has increased. Where the sin increases, the grace increases even more and superabounded. So now we're deciding to give everyone, not only Americans and Canadians, but anyone in the world the rights to Lake Michigan. So we're given this broad grace, but it still belongs to Michigan, but now everyone can use it. Prior to the law being given, Anyone could have used it. The law comes along and says, oh, it belongs to the, to the state of Michigan, but anyone can use it. I think that was a poor or a weak analogy, but how is it that there was no law and now there's a law and the law makes, defines sin because without the law, there's no sin. And now that there is sin, there needs to be grace to allow others who have trespassed to feel as though there's no penalty for that trespass. Again, it's not the best analogy, but it's what came to mind this morning as I was trying to put together some thoughts. So just as sin has reigned, so grace might reign and also through righteousness, which issues in eternal life. So the passage is not the easiest and that's why I said using an amplified translation might be helpful. So again, here's what I've said thus far. They're very long sentences. There are lots of conjunctions and there are lots of therefores, which means you have to go back and see why there's a therefore. And the passage that we start with today has effectively a therefore. It says, what shall we say then? So I'm gonna read the Amplified. Yes, maybe we should pause for prayer. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you more than anything for what Jesus did for the whole wide world, that we can be drawn into this covenant Help us to desire the things that are required for us to show that we are in covenant relationship, loyalty and obedience. May we do this with a willing heart and may we praise you as we think of what Jesus has done for the whole wide world, not only today, but always. May we be a blessing as we share in this study and as we share with others your great love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So if I can have someone read, and I know it's difficult to read from the Amplified, but if I, you can read... Chapter six. The whole thing? Yes, One through four. What yes, shall we say to all this? Are we to remain in sin in order that God's grace, favor, and mercy may multiply and overflow? Certainly not. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by the baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so we too might habitually live and behave in newness of life. For if we have become one with him by sharing a death like this, like his, we shall also be one with him in sharing his resurrection by a new life lived for God. We know that our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which is the instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive for evil, that we might no longer be the slaves of sin. For when a man dies, he is freed loosed, delivered from the power of sin among men. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him because we know that Christ, the anointed one, being once raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. 
For by the death he died, he died to sin, ending his relation to it once for all. And the life that he lives, he is living to God in unbroken fellowship with him. Even so, consider yourselves also dead to sin and your relation to it broken, but alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, rule as king in your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies to make you yield to its cravings and be subject to its lusts and evil passions. Do not continue offering or yielding your bodily members and faculties to sin as instruments or tools of wickedness, but offer and yield yourselves to God as though you have been raised from the dead to perpetual life and your bodily members and faculties to God, presenting them as implements of righteousness. For sin, shall not any longer exert dominion over you, since now you are not under law as slaves, but under grace as subjects of God's favor and mercy. What causes him to write this letter to them and tell them that they should not continue to live as uh, carnal Christians? They need to rise to a higher standard and I don't know if this is a good analogy, but since we've all passed through the parenting phase, we get the sense that we want our children to grow up. I can't think of any, as, as pleasant as it is to have a young baby and to be ooing and oing and showing off your young baby. I can't think of anyone who wants their child to remain a baby. We think there's something wrong when the child doesn't mature. We rush to the pediatrician, we go to the neurologist and we figure something is wrong. Can you figure out what is wrong? And I think that's part of what Paul is trying to tell these mainly Gentiles in Rome. Look, you recognize that you've come into this relationship, but it's not now that you have access and therefore that's all, you have the rights now. There are certain responsibilities and the responsibilities include obeying, understanding what is asked of you and maturing so that you come not just to take advantage of the grace that is given, but you also recognize that the growing leads to something. Every generation expects their children to be more successful than they. Sorry, if not expects, desires. The old cliche is that we tell them to stand on our shoulders and kill giants. Go out there and be your best. And when you see your children are not striving, how do you feel? A sense of, gee, have I done something wrong? We can't take responsibility for adults who are not trying. But we start to ask that question. Am I somehow responsible? Did I not encourage them in the right way? They talk about different models of parenting, authoritarian versus That's autocratic. Guilt. So what Paul is telling these people is, okay, you've been Christians now for a while. So what is required is that you grow up as Christians. What shall we say? Are we to remain in sin just because there is grace? It's like me telling my children after they're done with childhood. By the way, you still have access. You can still use your key to come in the house. Please not before you come in, but you still have a key to the house. And they come and they want their old room and they want to eat out of my refrigerator and they don't want to contribute anything. They want to live off the hog, so to speak. Not grow up. You say, no, you have to grow up. And that's what he's trying to tell these people in a nice way because he doesn't know them. But he's saying, are we to remain at that base level of entering into the relationship and getting God's favor so that God will continue to give grace? You want to continue to come and eat at my house because you're my child? and not contribute anything to it? How does he end verse two? Well, begin verse two, he says, certainly not. So we cannot continue to live at that baseline level of I've come into a relationship with God through Jesus. And I don't mean to be like slapping back at it. I heard John MacArthur, who is a reformed preacher in California. He criticized the Wesleyans 
in the past week. He basically said, you know, their understanding of sanctification is wrong. And he even mentioned the Salvation Army when he called a list of denominations. I said, okay, Dr. MacArthur, I respect you a lot, but you don't have to get that personal. <laughs> anyway, he is saying because they believe once saved, always saved. And again, sanctification occurs at salvation. So obviously it said, because we don't believe that, there's nothing wrong with our way of believing if you're saying you got to grow up. And I don't know how those who believe in once saved, always saved, deal with the idea that you can't lose the salvation you have. And therefore, even if you continue to live as what is called a carnal Christian, you still have your salvation secured. You got to grow up. And that's what he's trying to say here. You have to mature. Don't live at the baseline. Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us, and this is verse three through five are going to get unnecessarily controversial. He mentions the word baptize or baptism three times. But that is just a red herring. He is not interested in the idea of baptism here. He's basically saying, we have entered into this relationship with Jesus. And now he is raised. And therefore, we have to understand that that's the beginnings of the relationship. He says in verse 5, we have become one with him by sharing a death like his. And we shall also be one with him in sharing his resurrection by a new life lived for God. In other words, live for God. You have this new life. So act, the key thing here is, I once preached a sermon entitled, um, I forget the title of the sermon, basically, grow up. <laughs> grow up. And that's the call here. You can't remain a baby Christian. You can't act like a baby because it's unnatural for a human being to remain as a baby. We have to mature. He's somehow sending his credentials. I'm the authority. I'm an apostle and I've been called to be an apostle. I'm coming to you eventually, but there's something that's not working out clearly here. He doesn't articulate deeply on it, but he's basically saying to grow up. So we understand the analogy here is you've entered into the relationship. He's not focused on the baptism because Jesus did not baptize. He's basically talking about the entry into the relationship. And now that you're in the relationship, move on. You've entered the relationship. Don't remain baby Christians, effectively. So that is my introduction to the passage. And I thought that was important that because the passage is not easy, to, the context is hard to get. You can't just start with the verse one where it says, what shall we say then to all of this? All of what? You need to know what the all is. And once you have that, effectively, he asked four questions in the opening of the passage. What shall we say? Are we to remain in sin because there's grace? And then the exclamation mark appears. No. How can we who die to sin live in sin any longer? So grow up. Don't continue to live the way you lived before you accepted Christ. Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who become Christians accept his death and we don't end with that question mark we go to the new life he says we might habitually live and behave in newness of life for we have become one if we become one in sharing his death we are also to share in the resurrection by the new life we live and that's the key point new life and that's why it's an appropriate easter passage he goes on i don't want to say he beats them up but he basically goes into uh, for verse 6, the old self before Christ is nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross, which means it dies. And now we are no longer going to be slaves of sin. If we are died, we are freed from the power of sin. Now we've died with Christ. We believe we should live with him. So start living. Because we know that Christ, once being raised from the dead, will never die again. And death has no power over him. Again, the sentences are long. The four and the four and seven and ten. By the, the death he died, he died to sin. Even so, consider yourselves also dead to sin. So that's the main point he's making. Stop sinning. Your relation to sin is broken. And one of the questions I have is, why does he have to say that? Why does he have to tell them to stop sinning? Don't let sin rule as king in your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies to make you yield to its cravings. It would be nice, I think, 
if once you got saved, the desire to sin would just disappear. But the human nature haunts us. He says in verse 13, do not continue offering or yielding your bodily members to sin as instruments of wickedness. Why is he telling Christians this? Offer and yield yourselves to God as though you have been raised from the dead to perpetual life. Present your bodily members as implements of righteousness, of right doing. Do not let sin exert dominion over you. You're not under law, but under grace as subjects of God's favor and mercy. I'm going to pause there because I've pretty much reread the scripture and haven't given you a chance to talk. On the surface, the argument in verse one seems simple. If sin is increasing, grace should also increase as well. Well, Paul opposes this. So he asks, what is this opposition to this? He's saying, no, don't go on sinning because there's grace. Don't keep coming home and thinking you have access to the food in the refrigerator just because you have a key. You know? Why not come home and bring something when you come? Hey, dad, here is Easter dinner. I bought it with my own money and I'm bringing it for the family to share. Never going to happen. Show that you can make your way in life. Every parent wants their children to grow up. Otherwise, it's a failure. Therefore, what is happening? Again, it's bold. He's obviously heard about what's going on. And he has a comment on it. And Paul has a comment on many things. He has that aggressive style of evangelizing. In question number two, I mentioned that the baptism thing is a metaphor. And sometimes people get tangled into it thinking it's talking about baptism. But basically what he is saying is that we're baptized into Christ's death. So view his death and resurrection as a form of baptism. He's going into or under the ground. And then he is coming up again. And that's the whole idea of baptism, that you'll go under the water. Now, obviously, there are different types of baptism, sprinkling and infant baptism, etc. But many denominations who practice this baptism do the old um, John the Baptist style. You have to be immersed fully under the water. And that's a death. And because it was a Jewish form of baptism that was being taught then, it came into Christianity because Jesus subjected himself to the baptism of John the Baptist or John the baptizer, but he himself did not baptize. So it's a metaphor, and Paul is using the metaphor in the context not of water baptism, but Jesus dying, and he calls that a form of baptism, the significance of being baptized into Christ's death. And he's not telling these Gentiles that they need to undergo water baptism. He is saying the idea, understand the significance of being baptized into Christ's death. So that's my take on that. Again, I'm sure that the reformed people will criticize my comment, but <laughs> that is how I've interpreted it most of my life. We have died to sin, and that's the baptism. We've died to sin, and we are raised to life. What I did here in the passage is I underscored and highlighted all of the occurrences of the word death and dead and died in verses two through four and five, I guess. But then I also try to highlight the word life and live. And you'll see in verse two and verse four, live, live, life. And also in verse eight, live and verse 10, life. And also alive. So what I did was I tried to get the contrast to death and the living part. So in blue, you'll see me highlight the word live or live or alive. And I have in a brown, died, death, and dead. And I even have buried in yellow. And then I have raised in green. So I'm trying to show the contrast as I see it in this passage between dying to sin and being raised to new life. And that is the baptism he's talking about. Going under the blood of Jesus. So we are dying to sin and being raised the same way he is raised on Easter. We are raised to new life. The key is put off the old self of sin and put on the new self of being set apart and living a life that is pleasing to God. Growing up, and there's in an earlier passage, he talks about the growing up. I don't remember exactly where it was. I think it's in chapter five. Effectively, we need to show that growing up. I'm gonna pause for comment. Well, I think your explanation of baptism clarified about being baptized. Yeah, in this passage, he's not talking about water baptism at all. And he's hoping that, and that's the thing, he, he is an educated man. He uses not only long sentences, but metaphors that intelligent people 
may get, but the simple will struggle with because sometimes you're walking through the forest and you focus on every tree and every leaf on the tree when you're lost. No, you don't do that. You try to see where the sun is and look for a path to get out of the forest so you can get back to real life. So we get lost as we read these things because the sentences are long and the context is not 21st right. the century. The meanings change from one paragraph yes. or verse to the next, you know, and you have to really hone in on those words and try to figure out what he's trying to say, which is difficult. So, I appreciate you doing it. Imagine there being a rope in the forest. And if you put your hand on the rope and you just keep your hand on the rope, you'll get out of the forest. Even if you're looking around at all the trees, you might get out of the forest because you're saying, okay, this guiding rope is telling me if I hold on to this, I follow this rope, there's a way out. But while you're in the forest, you're living this life that is not natural because that's not your regular life. It's kind of like going on the mountain. You have to come back down. You can't live on the mountain. So you can't just live in the forest and be lost. You have to come back to where you need to be. And if part of the metaphor is all have sinned and all are lost until you receive what Jesus has offered, it's a way out, a way out of that life into a life that is an abundant life. I think I found, this might not be exactly what I'm looking for, but I think it will help. So I'm going to read Romans 5, starting at verse 2. Through him we also have our access, entrance, introduction by faith into this grace the state of God's favor, in which we firmly and safely stand. So we are in the grace and we are in it firmly and safely. And this is where the argument between the Calvinists and the Arminians become in your face because the Calvinists would say, well, it says that we firmly and safely stand in that grace, that God has given us that grace or that favor and we can't be out of that. We are firmly and safely in that grace. We're standing on that promise. Let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. So rejoice because this hope of experiencing the glory is a sure thing. Moreover, let us be full of joy now, exult and triumph in our troubles. So this is the passage I think is another key to the whole thing he's saying here. As you read verses three and four, you get a sense of what else is going on in Rome. Let us also be full of joy now let us exult and triumph in our troubles. So they're having troubles. It is obvious. Chapter 5, verse 3 says, rejoice in your trial, trials and your tri tribulations. Rejoice in your sufferings. Why would he say that unless they were suffering? So there's not enough growing up and there's suffering. We know that Nero is not exactly a fan of Christianity. We know that Nero is the one who is going to have Paul executed a few years later. So Paul is going to end up suffering in Rome, being crucified in Rome or beheaded in Rome, however his end comes, because the emperor is against this Christian sect and against the move. And therefore Paul is saying to those guys, perhaps you're suffering now, rejoice in our sufferings. One of the interesting things is how Paul identifies almost like a Gentile here. He starts out by saying, I'm writing to you Gentiles, and he uses we and our. So he's fully like embrace this idea. I am the apostle to the Gentiles, so I fully identify with the Gentiles. Rejoice in our sufferings. Those of us who are in this sect of Judaism slash new religion, new faith called Christianity, we know we are suffering, but rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that the pressure and affliction and hardship will produce endurance. So this is not easy for those in Rome. It's not easy that they are not necessarily maturing. It's not easy because they're suffering. So you can think of a situation where you're being persecuted because you chose to identify as a Christian. And the authorities are thinking, uh, we don't really care for this thing. So when you do that, you want to be an outsider. Are you volunteering to be an outsider? You recognize what you're giving up by identifying with this thing. Let us be full of joy, he said, knowing that we can rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the pressure, the affliction, and the hardship will produce something good. And what's that good thing? A patient and unswerving endurance. Well, Paul, how is that necessarily a good thing? The suffering will produce endurance? Well, I guess it's like working out at the gym. You know, you build up your strength. Endurance for what purpose? He tells us in verse 4. 
the endurance or the fortitude will develop into maturity of character. Okay, so endurance is on the road towards a mature character. This is the growing up. So he says, yes, you're suffering. Have the attitude of being joyful. Be full of joy, even as you suffer. This will lead to endurance. And endurance in verse four will lead to maturity of character. He's not done there. He says, and the character of this sort will produce a joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. Uh, I'm thinking of a song, praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. He or rock or hope of eternal salvation. I think that's where the author got that phrase. He is saying, you're suffering. There's not enough growing up. There needs to be more growing up, which means you have to be willing to endure the suffering. Yes, it's going to come with a cost. It will produce the endurance. The endurance will develop a mature character and that mature character will produce that confident hope of eternal salvation. So what's this hope? Is it a maybe so hope? No, it's a certainty, a confident hope. This is what is talked about in Hebrews 11.1, 1, that faith is the confident assurance that something is going to happen. It's the certainty of the promise. So it's a confident hope of eternal salvation he's talking about. So I think understanding what he's saying in chapter 5, 3 through 4, or maybe 1 through 4, will give us a clear sense of why he is saying what he's saying in 6, 1 through 14. In verse 5 of chapter 4, he says, this hope never disappoints. Because it's a certain hope. It doesn't delude, it doesn't shame us. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And while we were yet in weakness, at the fitting time, Christ died. So here he's going back to what he's saying in chapter 6. In our weakness, we are feeling powerless. But Christ died for the powerless. He died for the ungodly. And now it is an extraordinary thing for one to give his life even for an upright man. This is more of a parenthetical phrase. But in verse 8, he says, God shows clearly and proves his own love for us by the fact that he sent Christ to die for our sins. Therefore, in verse 9, because we are acquitted, made righteous, and brought into a right relationship with God by Christ's blood. So again, you see he's talking about what happened in the Easter vigil, so to speak how much more certain it is that we shall be saved by him from the indignation and wrath of God. He's still taking a long time to make the point. And then he goes into a four in verse 10. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more certain now that we are reconciled that we shall be saved. So again, what is he talking about? He's talking about the endurance delivered daily from sin's dominion through his resurrected life. Again, not the easiest idea, but once you understand why he is doing this, why he is writing like this, I think it becomes more clear, or clearer, I should say, that they are having a hard time. So we can think of our own lives when you have struggled, either struggle with the faith or ask, why is it that I'm trying to do what is right and the results don't look like easy peasy lemon squeezy? I'm following the right path and the results are hard to come by. He's saying, Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. There is light at the end of this tunnel. You do what you're called to do. Recognize that there's a hope that is promised to us. And, and Jim, are you yes. familiar with the phrase, what doesn't kill us makes us strong? <laughs> and variants on that too, yes. So he's basically telling them that. You know, this will lead to something good. And for everyone who is struggling with something, we have to tell ourselves and tell them that. We have to remind them that you can't live in the moment all the time. That's an immature way where you emote everything that you feel. That's, what, that's not what mature people do. They say, okay, trials come. Trials come in life. But hopefully in the growing up portion of life, Parents have allowed children to experience some kind of falling down and bruising their knees. By the way, my sister always said you should bruise your knees every night. <laughs> when you pray, get down on your knees. That was one of her things. Bruise your knees, she would tell her children. But understand that life will bring hardship. It is not always an easy path. One writer says, if all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be? And where the fight? But in the darkness, God gives to you chances of proving that you are true. Let us hold on then, never despair. Live about feeling, the songwriter says. Victory is there. Recognize that you have the assurance 
And when you have the assurance, don't really nilly and, oh yeah, uh, it looks as though God didn't answer that prayer or he allowed this terrible thing to happen to me or to someone I love. Live above feeling. The songwriter okay. says, victory is there. He understands you, knows all your needs. Trusting in him, you're sure to succeed. What's that success? It can't be material success. It can't be recognizing that if you follow the rules that everything will work. Understanding that it is that hope that he talks about in chapter five, verse five. So I think if I were to summarize, chapter five should have been the study. Chapter five, verses one through four. Understanding, again, writing to an audience he doesn't know, we are acquitted from that sin nature. We're given right standing with God through faith. So the lettuce, I love it when they use vegetables in the scripture. Yes. I wish that some celery and some carrots were there as well. But let us, I want you to focus on this phrase. Because if you read it from the NIV or the King James, you don't get the full sense. But when you read it from the Amplified, the authors have done a fantastic job. They have changed the verb. I'm not sure saying that it makes it good. How can you change the verb? You know, don't add the scripture. That's another thing why people don't care for the Amplified Bible because it adds words that are not in the Greek or in the Hebrew. But I think that context is important. And when you understand that you could get lost because of the wrong understanding of the verb, you ask, well, what is a better understanding of the verb? Let me throw in a quick analogy that bothered me from the time I was a child. Jesus was hanging on the cross and one gospel writer says that one of the guys, the two thieves on the opposite sides, whether they were thieves or not, is not for me to discuss. One of them started taunting them and saying, hey, if you're the Christ, <laughs> save us. Save yourself and save us. And the other one said, show respect. Show respect. This is God. What he basically what? says is, Lord, when you go into your kingdom, remember me. So one of the thieves reprimanded the other one for saying, hey, let's all get off these cross and <laughs> be free by saying, when you go into your kingdom, in other words, I understand that you are indeed God. When you go into your kingdom, remember me. I'm not sure what he meant, but what Jesus offered him was fantastic. Jesus said, I tell you today, you shall be with me in paradise. I'm making a point here. I was bothered for a long time growing up. Is he saying, I tell you, comma, today you shall be with me in paradise because what has to happen between Good Friday and Easter is not today. So at what stage does he become to be in paradise with Jesus? And it dawned on me that perhaps if the comma were moved, I'm not trying to uh, edit the Bible, but since a lot of the punctuation has been added, that the editors could have done the wrong thing. I tell you today, comma, and this is key. You shall be with me in paradise. Whether it's today, tomorrow, or the next day, paradise is forever. You shall be with me in paradise. I'm telling you right now, you shall be with me. So the word today or the punctuation can cause us to lose track and ask more questions. I'm making the point that in trying to understand in 21st century English what was written 2,000 years or 4,000 years ago, we have to give in for the fact that the translators are human. And that's why there's so many translations with slightly different interpretations, but even translations like the Amplified, I think are helpful, especially in Romans, because of the struggles with what is the key verb. So let me get back to the point. Therefore, 5.1, since we are justified through faith, the parenthesis after let us is what I'm going to focus on. Let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold on to and enjoy. Let me take out the parentheses and read it the way another translation would write it. Let us have peace with God. So the two parenthetical phrases there. I hope you can see where I'm at. I'm going to highlight, and maybe you would say it's a square bracket, not a parenthesis, but <laughs> pardon me. So here's what the Amplified authors have done with the scripture. They've added the phrase grasp with that. So without that, you're reading it. Let us have peace with God. But earlier he said we have the peace. So why is he saying let us have peace if you already have the peace? This is why reading it the way the Amplified has it makes a little more sense. Grasp the fact that we have the peace. It's like telling my children, you already have the insurance. You already have the assurance. You already are in the will. So 
you don't have to have the money right now or whatever you'll get after I die. It's yours. It, it will be yours. So grasp the fact that you have the insurance. I'm not going to write you out of my will. Okay, that's a terrible analogy. But let us grasp the fact that we have the peace. Is it possible then to have the peace of reconciliation and not know that you have the peace? That's the point he's making here. There's a lot going on. He's just gone through who Abraham was and how that promise was given to Abraham, even though he was 100 years old, his wife was past the age of childbearing. They were dead pretty much to childbearing. And Abraham had the faith that God will do this thing. And his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Then he goes after talking about Abraham in chapter four. He says, we also are declared righteous. The same way Abraham was declared righteous. We are declared righteous through faith. Abraham was declared righteous through faith, and we also are declared righteous through faith. Therefore, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and enjoy, even now or in the future. So you can think of all the songs that talk about peace. I have peace like a river in my soul, but there's turmoil around me. One writer says, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Maybe but we still have the turmoil in our life because stuff still happens. And if the stuff is happening, does that mean that God has left us? No. One writer, Annie Johnson Flint says, God has not promised skies always blue, flower strewn pathways all our lives through. He has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. He has not told us we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He has not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. My songbook is next to me. I can look it up, but anyway. She ends by saying, but God has promised strength for the day, help for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. There's a promise. And what the promise includes is stuff that will get us through the trials. And we have the assurance. So he's saying we have the peace of reconciliation to hold on to and to enjoy the reconciliation. We are reconciled to Christ. We're reconciled to God through what Christ did and enjoy that peace that peace with God. So don't live in turmoil when you can live in peace. Even though life is full of turmoil, hold on to the peace. Happiness is based on happiness, but joy is enduring. Joy is kind of like under the water, whereas the surface of the water is the happiness. Oh, the storm is too big, but deep down in the ocean floor, there's no storm. So joy needs to be like deep down in your soul. You have this peace. You have the peace of reconciliation to hold on to. You have the peace of reconciliation to enjoy that peace with God because of what Jesus did. He has another vegetable, but the same vegetable in verse 3. Let us be full of joy now. Hey, there's even more vegetables here. Let us <laughs> exult and triumph in our troubles. So it's not as much vegetables as in let, um, Hebrews, but it's good enough. It's enough for a salad. Caesar. Caesar, thank you. That's what <laughs> Caesar said, right? So, my friends, life is full of turmoil. <laughs> Our human life brings disappointment. It brings struggle. But I see four doses of lettuce right here. So that's what he's saying. Let us grasp. Let us rejoice. Let us be full of joy. So... Let this be your dessert for today or your meal for today. Stop sinning. Please don't live like infants. Move on because of what Jesus has done. Again, the passage is chosen because it's Easter and because there's reference to resurrection and death and all that kind of good stuff. But I think that six is hard enough to understand unless you understand that he's basically saying, let us grow up and do not continue offering your bodily members to sin as instruments of wickedness. Why is he writing to Christians and telling them that? I guess because they're doing the wrong thing. And it's disappointing that he has to write that. It's kind of like having to tell your grown children, well, you know what, I really expect more of you. Because you don't want to do that because then they start to feel resentment and it creates division. Thankfully, Paul had the courage <laughs> to be in your face with these people he doesn't know. And for us, 2,000 years later to read it, and slap ourselves and say, you know what? I need to grow up. I can't continue to slum because I have everything he just said. 
I have the salvation, I have the assurance, I have the peace. I just need to take my eyes off of the turmoil and focus on the peace. Verse 14, sin shall no longer exert dominion over you. Now you're not under the law as slaves, but under grace as subjects of God's favor and mercy. Amen. Thank God for grace. We really appreciate this, dear God, the grace that you've given us. And we pray that we will not cheapen the grace by the way we live our lives, expecting that you will indeed just forgive us for every time we fall out of favor or we trespass against your law because sin can only be done against you. Help us to walk circumspectly in obedience to your call on our lives and to show that maturing that you anticipate and expect of us. Thank you for the grace when we do fall in spite of our efforts, but we know that while stuff happens in our life, that we can claim that we have the anchor that keeps the soul steadfast amidst the storms. So we pray, dear God, that when you don't remove the storms, that you will take the storm out of our hearts and out of our soul. Bless us, we pray, as we thank you for what Jesus did, for the recollection and the remembrance of what he did for us. May we live our lives to please you so that others be drawn to you as a result of our living. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. amen.